Faye Hopkins, I use he, him pronouns. I'm a professor in the School of Theater, Television, and Film here at San Diego State University, and I'm the interim director of the SDSU Center for Teaching and Learning. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this event, the second Lunch and Learn event of this semester. The third Lunch and Learn event is coming up November 15th, and that's going to be a kind of premature retrospective on the first semester that we knew was going to be heavily impacted by generative AI. Be on the lookout for the next CTL bullet bulletin. It's one of the emails you often delete. <laughs> but today's Lunch and Learn event is called Can We Really Do That? De-emphasize lecturing in large enrollment courses. And before I introduce our host and our speaker, uh, the campus's land acknowledgement. For millennia, the Kumeyaay people have been a part of this land. This land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the San Diego State community, we acknowledge this legacy. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the host for this event, Dr. Allison Vaughn. Dr. Vaughn is, yes, yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> Applause is appropriate. Dr. Vaughn <laughs> is a professor in the Department of Psychology at San Diego State, and she is the Associate Director for the SDSU Center for Teaching and Learning. Dr. Vaughn will introduce the session, moderate the session, handle the Q&A after, and of course she'll be introducing today's featured speaker. Thank Allison? You. All right, welcome everyone. Um, it's my honor uh, and privilege to introduce this one. I know that we had a lot of people, the line was long for lunch, so be shuffling them in and out. Um, but I have the distinct privilege of welcoming Jenna Speglia. Uh, she is a biology education researcher and an assistant professor in the biology department. Her biology education research lab focuses on the complex interplay of cognitive, affective, psychosocial, environmental, and institutional factors that promote and inhibit meaningful learning of fundamental biological concepts like natural selection, matter, energy transformation. Uh, her lab has recently received funding from the NSF to implement and study foundational educational reform in the biology department here at SDSU. So our students are her subjects and our classes are her labs. Um, in order to diversify ecology and evolutionary biology degree participation and career pursuits. So please help me welcome Jenna. Hi. Thank you very much. Hi everyone. It's, it's really such a privilege to talk to all of you, my colleagues. Um, you know, I've only been at SDSU now for a little bit over a year, and so it's really just a privilege to um, have everyone kind of interested in the kinds of work that I do not, uh, for my research, um, but also to uh, better and improve the institutions that I'm part of. And so you may have noticed I have two titles for my talk, and I promise I will address both of those things, um, both the blind spots and the answer to that question, can we really do this? So. This kind of image is probably why a lot of us are here today. And actually, before I talk about it, can I have it raise a hand? How many people here are in the sciences? OK, in math? OK. <laughs> um, yeah, that's right. And um, uh, the arts. OK, uh, great. So we have a, a, a distribution of different um, uh, disciplines here. One of the patterns that we notice in STEM, in the STEM field, that's extremely concerning, is that over 60% of students who enter college intending to major in a STEM degree do not complete that STEM degree. It's actually a really, really, really big number. And this is a nationwide uh, trend. And it's the kind of uh, statistics that concern a lot of us in this room. Um, and unfortunately, the probability of receiving a STEM degree are actually quite a bit lower for minoritized students, even when we control for things like grades. And so to give you a little bit of data here, the probability of attaining a STEM degree for STEM intending students in this, this particular sample uh, is much lower for an underrepresented minority female than for a white male. Uh, controlling for grades, everyone getting a C or above in all those intro courses, or uh, uh, in this case, having one grade or more that's below a C. Um, the, a probability of a URM female uh, obtaining a STEM degree with one grade less than a C drops to 21%, uh, which is quite a bit lower than a white male counterpart. So we have this national trend where students 
are not persisting in STEM degrees through graduation, though they come in to our campuses motivated, interested, talented, and for minority students, the rate is even worse. And so there are kind of two ways to think about addressing this really problematic pattern. And the first way is, well, we have to fix the students, right? These students are not doing well in our classes. Uh, what can we do to you know, change the student, fix the students so that they will do better in our classes? So that's one, one perspective, one approach. And there are actually a lot of actual actions happening on a lot of college campuses that use this fix uh, the student approach. But the other approach that is much more supported by theory and research um, and equity and inclusion work is actually there's nothing wrong with the students, right? These students come to us as who they are with lifetimes of experience under their belts and it is the institution who is responsible for serving the students as they are. We've accepted them into our institution and so it's the institution that must change. And so this is the, um, the lens through which uh, education researchers like me and uh, and now more and more college campuses are uh, approaching our change work um, and there are some pivotal texts out there that provide key evidence to support the changing the institution uh, approach and talking about leaving revisited is one of these key key texts so is quite a bit of literature uh, present in, uh, the, in peer-reviewed journals, including high-impact journals like PNAS and Science. And so I, I'm actually not going to present all this evidence today that active learning works. Like, it's, it, it can work. It is actually well established in literature that under the right circumstances, it can work. But what I will talk to you about today is that, and I really want to emphasize that active learning is but one piece of a whole, whole huge large puzzle uh, that we have to pay attention to when we're engaging in changing our classrooms and changing our institutions. And so this is kind of an overview of what we'll discuss. First, that question that maybe got you here today. Can we really do that? Can we de-emphasize lecture? Can we do more active learning? Can we change our classrooms? And can we change our institution? And the short answer is yes, we can. And I'll share with you our experience doing that, which is by no means the only uh, way to go about doing these kinds of changes. Many people at SDSU and um, outside of SDSU are engaging in meaningful change using other approaches. And then I'll talk a bit about the lessons learned about the blind spots in institutional uh, reform that uh, may uh, be helpful to those here. So first, I'm going to introduce you to a traditional gateway biology course. This is a real course. That is a real classroom. No, it's not here at SDSU. Um, and this course is a, a, a biology course, it's the gateway course to the biology major. It's required by biology um, uh, students who are intending to complete a biology major, 570 students in one classroom. Uh, there's a balcony at the top as well where more students can be piled in. There are no undergraduate TAs. It's in that room, it's one instructor standing on a literal stage. Lecture-based, no active learning. Uh, content not aligned with national biology curriculum recommendations. Uh, it, uh, there are lots of na uh, nationally recognized uh, uh, policy documents that exist for many disciplines, including biology, that outline, well, what is it that biology undergraduates must know by the time they graduate? This course was not aligned with any of those. No measurable learning objectives. Exams focused on memorization, multiple choice tests only, high DFW rates, low course grades, low attendance, low course evaluations, learning not measured. Might sound familiar to some of the classes you've perhaps taken yourself or experienced uh, in another way. Uh, also, psychosocial variables are not measured, such as evolution acceptance, sense of belonging, STEM identity compatibility. So in about 10 years time, and yeah, it takes a while sometimes, this course was reformed and uh, into a evidence-aligned active learning course taking place in the classroom you see here on the right, where 100 students per classroom uh, were uh, gathered together and learning collaboratively in groups. Though still, this in each semester, without adding additional faculty, we served 600 students per semester. 30 to 50 undergraduate TAs. No, uh, there was absolutely no live lecturing. And when I say no, I mean no live lecturing. There was uh, lots more active learning. Uh, all content was aligned with national curriculum recommendations. There were measurable learning objectives, cognitively complex exams, 
multiple assessment formats, greater than 95% attendance at every active learning session, low DFW rates, think less than 5%, high course grades, about 30% A's is what's typical, high course evaluations, learning measured for most units, and psychosocial variables measured. So how do you get there, right? Like that's actually the question that eludes most of us. I don't think most of us need to be convinced that we want to get there. And so institutional commitments are key. So what were the institutional commitments that we needed to get there? And it will be different for different institutions um, and different courses. We needed access to 100 person active learning classroom six times each week. We needed the registrar to allow unusual scheduling patterns, which actually a lot of registrars really aren't equipped to do. We needed formal compensation of time for course development. We needed the assignment of graduate TAs or GTAs to that course. A lot of intro courses have zero graduate TAs, and so we needed uh, uh, some of those assigned. But the personnel needed was a multi-year collaboration between two permanent biology faculty members with a 1-1 teaching load. One of these biology faculty members had expertise in um, biology education research. This person was a biologist, but also with that education um, expertise. There was also a discipline-based education research, or DBER, postdoc, contributing to course development and teaching. And that was me, in case you're wondering. <laughs> um, we had two to four graduate TAs per semester and 30 to 50 undergraduate TAs earning credit. But what did it cost? About $350,000 of external funding was required uh, mostly for postdoc salary and summer salary. So I'm not going to actually go through this in a lot of detail, and I, but the point really is like this doesn't happen overnight. This happens in bite-sized chunks over a somewhat long period of time, and that's okay. That's how it actually should happen. Otherwise, it's really not realistic. It's not iterative, and it's probably not evidence-based because if it happens quickly, you're probably not informing the next year's changes over the prior year's data. And so the colors on this number line, which go from 2013 to 2023, represent the approximate proportion of active learning. Um, but you, what you'll notice here is that the types of changes that I'm going to be talking about are not just increasing active learning. So in, 2020, in 2013, when these reforms began, we did things like revising all the learning objectives to make them actually measurable. Most learning objectives in a lot of intro courses are actually not measurable. We added undergraduate TAs, we added pre-post diagnostic testing, and we started to add things like clicker questions to start bringing in active learning, even though this was a 570 person classroom. The next year we were able to move the course to a smaller classroom that you see pictured there, 250 students uh, uh, in that classroom with two sections. We revised lecture content, added more clicker questions, um, we expanded the UTA program in subsequent years, added more UTAs, we then began actually assigning groups in this classroom. Uh, these were heterogeneously assigned groups to, to disperse the privilege uh, across the, the classroom. And we added a technique called misconception-focused instruction. So yes, active learning is increasing. But we also added this other technique where we explicitly identify, address, and design our content around the learning challenges that students have with the content. We didn't invent this. This is a very... Uh, um, well-known and well-loved uh, approach, but actually there isn't a lot of evidence on how beneficial it is, um, though there is now. Um, we then started to incorporate culturally relevant modules. We eventually, in 2019, initiated formal preparation workshops for our undergraduate TAs, which was actually an absolutely enormous, <coughs> enormous advance that I cannot overemphasize. Our undergraduate TAs are absolutely phenomenal, and when they receive appropriate preparation, they are key to doing this kind of work in a large enrollment course. Um, finally, well, oddly, when COVID happened, we flipped the whole course, which was where we wanted to get, but we were taking it slower than that until we had the impetus to really not lecture at a bunch of black boxes. So all the content, the lecture content, was moved into video format, and all the face-to-face -face time, in this case on Zoom, was active learning. And then eventually we moved the class to an in-person, actual, physical active room and uh, learning classroom space. And that's what the class is now. Uh, all of these things that have happened in the past led up to this um, evidence-aligned active learning classroom where we have 100 people per room, six sections of that, and all lecturing is done 
uh, asynchronously via video, and all in-person time is heterogeneously, is, is work done in heterogeneously designed groups. And so what I want to emphasize here is that the number of students served per se semester has increased, actually, slightly. Um, Right? This is the, tr the traditional semester in that terrible 570 person classroom, the smaller classroom semester, and then finally the active learning classroom semester. We have actually increased the number of students served. And the faculty contact hours and the number of faculty required has stayed the same. We also show signs of learning, right? Is this actually working? It all, a lot of bells and whistles, but is it actually working? And so what I'm showing you here is evolution understanding um, increasing as the amount of evidence-based uh, strategies, active learning, and misconception-focused instruction increased. And this does mostly go through time, with red being the least evidence-aligned semester in that terrible large classroom, and the blue being the uh, more recent semesters that are much more evidence aligned. And so we can see that learning actually has significantly and with large effect sizes increased for evolution content knowledge using two different instruments measuring the same thing. And we have significantly decreased evolution misconceptions which are notoriously robust, very hard to remove and help students work through their misconceptions. And, so, and this is work that I was part of, and it was published in Bioscience last year. So that work is available for you. In 2023, this entire course was expanded to SDSU with, of course, continued improvement. This is a different student population, and so that who we serve has to be a major consideration for how we serve them. And so these are some of the examples of what happened in Gateway, Gateway Biology at SDSU in 2023. Again, this is the Gateway course, the biology major. Every biology major must take this course. And so it is a, a traditionally a 300-person class in a large 300-person lecture hall. I reduced that class size uh, to 100-person classrooms. Uh, specifically, this is actually a layout of the room. Students sit around these round tables. This is PS 130 for those of you who have um, perhaps seen that room or taught in that room before. They work in groups of three. The uh, green are undergraduate TAs who are assigned more or less one per, per table. And uh, you'll notice the faculty member is kind of somewhere in the middle, right? Not in the front of the room, not lecturing, not the most important person. And if you zoom in on a, on a table, this is what it kind of looks like with students working in groups of three on a cognitively challenging biology task, solving biological problems with their undergraduate TA, that's Nika there, working with these groups. And so we've, again, removed all in-person lecturing, increased active learning and group work, again, in heterogeneously designed groups. We've added about 33 very well-prepared undergraduate teaching assistants who take their own three-credit course so that they really know what they're doing in this classroom and can really be effective for students. We developed and implemented equity-focused learning assistant preparation program for our TAs, implemented mastery-based, not curve-based grading, added representation of diverse scientists to all units, culturally relevant and socially relevant modules were added as well. And again, I want to emphasize we are serving the same number of students. And actually, this design is scalable. We could serve more. Uh, and the faculty per semester and the contact hours per faculty member have stayed the same. What did this take? So institutional commitments, access to 100-person active learning classroom three times a week. Actually, this is one of the largest challenges to this kind of reform, getting the right classroom that is appropriate for learning. There aren't that many of them, and they tend to be highly um, uh, solicited by other faculty on campus, understandably so. Again, the registrar allowing atypical scheduling patterns. Uh, the registrar here was very willing but it is a challenge to even explain the kind of scheduling that we need uh, to, uh, a, a, to a registrar that is used to doing it one way. And then, of course, they have to make this match up and work with all the other classes on campus. These are not small institutional commitments. Um, the assignment of a graduate TA, course previously, didn't have one. Additional startup funds earmarked for course reform. So there was some negotiation at uh, the time of my hiring that funds would be uh, devoted to the reform of this course. But I'll say, the startup, actually, it's not, uh, not an enormous amount of money. We're not talking hundreds of thousands of dollars or anything like that. Personnel. One faculty member with deeper experience, uh, expertise, teaching a 3-0 load, which is higher uh, than uh, is typical for a, a, a first-year 
faculty member, uh, one graduate TA, and about 33 undergraduate TAs earning credit. What did it cost? Nothing. Externally, that is. Zero external funds were needed, <laughs> nor available. <laughs> um, but that doesn't mean that we haven't been successful in securing funds. This kind of reform is very attractive to funding agencies. And so in 2023, I received a $500,000 NSF grant um, with myself as the PI to support further departmental reform so that the reform happening in this course is just the beginning and we can pay attention to the entire uh, pathway, right? Because students don't just take intro courses. They also have uh, uh, and several more years to pay attention to, which means we have to pay attention to them as well. So what are some of the blind spots in reform? So I've just kind of shown you like, yeah, th this can be done, but what are some of the blind spots that exist uh, when we're trying to do institutional ref reform that can really trip us up? I have a few here that I hope are helpful. First of all, students are learning. If we really believe students are learning in our classrooms, it's really hard to change things because that's like a scary prospect. Like, well, what if they stop learning? Or what if they learn less? Or what if they're not as well prepared for the next course, people will be mad at me, I'll have failed my students. <clears throat> Unfortunately, learning of fundamental concepts is frequently not measured in the first place in our classes. We don't know too much about that in a lot of our classes. But when it is measured, reports consistently show that learning is not frequently happening in many lecture-based courses. So this is, of course, terrible news. But the silver lining here is that, oh, we're free to make some evidence-based changes now because we're not going to harm them by making them less prepared. Because probably in most of these lecture-based courses at many institutions, learning is very low. And I'm showing you here some real data. Um, uh, and note the traditional course, that lecture-based course is shown in red. This is evolution knowledge pretest and post-test in a class that was centered on the concept of evolution. No learning. Real data in a recent semester. So, students enjoy active learning. They actually often don't enjoy active learning more than the uh, traditional lecture hall. And I think many of you are nodding your heads, you've probably experienced this or you're worried about this. Uh, this is the case even when they learn more. And so this study, a uh, 2019 study, shows that in a test of learning, in this active learning semester, in this dark gray, they, learn, they learned more, right? That's great. But their evaluations on, I enjoyed this lecture, I felt like I learned a great deal, the instructor was effective, and so on, consistently, it was rated lower in the active learning class than in the otherwise equivalent uh, passive learning class. And this is the same faculty member teaching the same content using different approaches. Active learning is enough. Active learning is not enough. It's 100% not enough. It's, again, one piece of this puzzle. Um, active learning deals with how one teaches, and it reflects a broad range of teaching strategies. It's not just one thing. And so identifying and implementing other strategies in addition to active learning is also critical. So for example, that misconception-focused instruction that I mentioned before, cross-case comparisons where you look at the same phenomenon in multiple contexts, and critique activities are really well-supported uh, by evidence approaches for helping students learn that can be done in an active learning context or not in an active learning context. What one teaches and doesn't teach is actually as important as how they teach it. So we can't just focus on our strategies, we have to pay attention to our content. And I can't emphasize that more because the strategy part, the active learning part, has gotten a lot of hype. But the content part has to be co-equal with the strategies we're using to teach it. There have actually been many discipline-specific calls, and in biology, it's called vision and change, but there, they, it exists in probably all disciplines. And these calls typically call for us to reduce the volume of content, and not by like a little, by like a lot, like half of it, and shift our prioritization of content to fundamental concepts as opposed to memorization of facts. And then, of course, how to measure knowledge and learning is critical. We have to measure learning, which means that we have to have a, a longitudinal uh, uh, system in place to gather data from our students. So 
And the data that we gather should be on cognitively complex items, not memory-based items, but cognitively complex items. We, one may refer to that as high Bloom's level, for example, if you're familiar with, with that uh, concept. And so these questions, these cognitively complex questions prioritize assessing actual knowledge, not memorization, not test taking skills, and not time spent studying, the latter of which, actually many of these of which, are actually highly associated with privilege. So pre-unit or pre-course testing is needed. It indicates where students begin. And it, it is necessary to help us understand how far our course has helped us move students forward. Traditional exams that happen mid-semester at the end of the semester, they measure knowledge at, hopefully they're measuring knowledge. <laughs> uh, they measure that at one specific time point. High grades mean low rigor. I think this is a concern of a lot of faculty when implementing a, a lot of changes to their courses, including changes to their grading scheme. Um, but actually high grades and high rigor must go together and they actually frequently do go together. So when content matches national recommendations, evidence-based strategies are prioritized and assessments measure learning, higher grades may be expected due to more learning and less penalization of students for low prior preparation, which is a uh, cause of uh, academic privilege and is no has nothing to do with the student themselves. And so what I'm showing you here are highly preliminary data but showing you the cognitive complexity of, an exa of exams question in a reformed course, the percent DFW rates, which is low, and the percent of A's, which is high, as compared to the uh, percent cog cognitively complex exam questions in a traditional course, DFW rates, percent A's. Rigor and high grades often and can and should and must go together. DFW rates are critical indicators. So DFW rates should be interpreted with extreme caution. When they are high, we must pay attention to them, but they can be misleading when they are low. They can change simply by lowering our standards, which is not an okay way to move forward in our reform efforts. Um, direct measures of student learning, such as pre-post testing, is critical for monitoring how well our students' are, needs are being served. So yes, DFW records are a good tool, uh, in some ways, but we must measure learning. All departments and courses must begin measuring learning of core content and tracking how students of various backgrounds differentially progress through our courses and through our degree programs. And so this last one here I thought was important because everyone here cares. Mm -hmm. You're here because you care. Most faculty care. Most faculty actually put a lot of time into their courses. So if we care enough, positive change will happen. That, Sometimes that message seems to be sent. But failing to make positive change does, does not imply a lack of care. It's very difficult to help people learn, and it's actually not intuitive. Research shows that many faculty put a large amount of time and, uh, into their teaching and into changing their courses. Um, but what all this means is that it's critical that evidence-based actions, not simply time and caring, uh, are complementing our already high levels of caring about our students. And finally, the more change the better, right? Let's just change it all up. Um, so much of the considerable effort, and it really is considerable, that faculty put into improving their courses doesn't have particularly high bang for their buck. Some of it does, but a lot of it really does not. And so fortunately, there's abundant evidence over many, many, many decades uh, about what works for student learners in STEM and in other disciplines and learners of different backgrounds. And adopting an epistemology in which evidence informs all of our decisions in the classroom, just like it informs our decisions in research, can help faculty shift their efforts towards high impact changes without adding considerable time to their work. So we can do this, and many of us here already are starting. So I have a list here of citations that, I, that are, is available if anyone's interested in any of, of the work that I've uh, presented. And I am going to show you a list of acknowledgments. And it's a really big risk to l name people. But the point is that this doesn't happen with one person, especially considering that we're, we're doing institutional change with institutions, not against institutions. And so all the people in this list on the left Many of them are from SDSU and were part, they don't, may not even know they were part of this course existing 
people in financial aid, people in um, administrative offices, faculty members who observed the course, uh, 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 people who helped get the right classroom, uh, people who let me collect data in, in, in their classes. Couldn't have done it without, without these people. And then, of course, all of our undergraduate TAs from the first semester who didn't really know what they were getting themselves into, but every single one of them stuck it out, every single one. And so thank you all, and please ask questions. Jump into questions. I wanted to make sure that the sign in sheet got around. I think it's not very good. It's going on its way back. And then questions for Jenna. Yes. So, how is lowering, how is teaching less content not lowering um, academic standards? For example, I've noticed some colleagues, if they want to improve their teaching evaluations, will teach less content, mm -hmm. say, out of the textbook. So how so you shouldn't lower yeah. academic standards, but yet at the same time you said that teaching less content improves mm -hmm. learning. Mm -hmm. Yep. So typically when I think about academic standards, it's about the standards that I want students to meet, right? So I have a, the standards, I want them to learn these things. Students aren't nationally meeting these standards. So if we take that perspective, that okay, in my classroom, I now have evidence, as I showed you here for evolution, for example, students are not meeting my evolution standards. So my standards are not being met. The way that I am supporting the students and learning them is not working. Um, that gives the impetus to allow you to change some things. And so typically what we have in a lot of our introductory courses is an enormous volume of information that like literally research on cognition, decades of research on cognition show, it's not how the brain works. Brain does not work that way. So the standards aren't high, they're unreasonable. Students aren't meeting them and they should not meet them because the standards do not align with how the human brain functions. So I, I think that that's a useful way to reframe it is that, oh, my standards don't work with human brains. It's, a, it's way more content then any one person can be expected to learn. And I don't mean memorize, because students, some, have the time, the emotional and the mental space to memorize all those things. So that's how we get A's, small fraction of them often, in these introductory courses. It's not that some students don't have the time and ability to memorize. That exists. But they are almost certainly not learning fundamental concepts of biology or these other disciplines in that classroom. And you know, again, the data I showed you supports that. The, the evolution assessment that I showed you there, it's a high school level assessment. And the, the students leaving the introductory course, biology majors had it, were failing it, and didn't improve from pretest. So yeah, our standards are not in alignment with how people's brains work. So, so we think about changing our standards, not reducing, not lowering our standards. Changing our standards to be more in alignment with, with the human brain. And actually, I would argue that, um, you know, I teach about half the content, and I would argue that in all, in, in the course I showed you over the past 10 years at a different institution, in all of the core areas of biology that uh, national recommendations um, calls for, they, they're meeting or, or uh, meeting those standards as opposed to in the traditional courses where they're probably not meeting any of them. Sasha? Yeah. So, so I guess I have a follower. So it's a gateway course. You have a now grant that is gonna look at other courses, mm -hmm. but in deciding or in thinking about the curriculum for the gateway, um, how was your work um, informed by what's happening in the other courses to where the students are going to go? That's such a good question. So, um, in at, so the, the, this work was done over 10 years at a different institution, and so we knew very well the, the expectations um, that faculty had for students in their next set of courses. Um, but what I want to emphasize is that uh, the uh, like AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, um, 
has gathered experts in biology uh, over quite a number of years and come to a really impactful document outlining what it is that biology students must know by the time they graduate. And so I'm aware, we were aware of what students were expected to know by the next faculty in the next courses, but we were guided by what the national recommendations from experts in biology have said using evidence and uh, peer review and like ser serious biology expertise, um, what they have said students have to know. So we were, we were mostly guided by these evidence-based standards. Um, now, can that cause conflict in, in departments where this change is happening? It absolutely can. And so what, what we did, and what I would recommend everyone do, is get your data collection apparatus in place and make it robust. Because there are some um, defenses you have to be prepared for. You've l reduced the content, you have more A's, your course was easier. That's why students like it more, or that's why they, uh, why, why they seem to be doing better, or something like that. But if you get your data in place, and ideally also collect data in the semesters before the change was made, um, and even <coughs> encourage faculty in other classes to gather data uh, as students move on to the next, the next course, um, what, we what we saw is that students who took our introductory course at this other institution were better prepared for the next courses. Not worse, not less prepared, because again, they're not really learning in the traditional courses. So they mostly forget all the things they memorize by the time they get into the next course. But if they've learned these fundamental concepts, that they can bring with them and that they can add more um, complicated uh, biology on top of. So guiding by standards, but also preparing your infrastructure to respond to possible concerns under and understandable concerns that other faculty in the department or that the de department at large may have. Um, yeah. Thank Hi. you so much for a great talk. Sure. Um, I have a quick question. Um, you showed some data when it comes to active learning and the classical learning, mm -hmm. and um, you showed that in the in a class of active learning, the uh, performance of the students went lower than the. Yeah. Was so, that the one with all the bar yes, graphs, the, the gray yes, one? Yeah. Yes. So I just I have a quick question in regard to that. So. Um, do you think that in that part, like the students' uh, performance went lower because they had less not performance? Uh, sorry, evaluation. Evaluation. Yeah, yeah. So for the for that part, so the evaluation went lower because like, is it something related to they had less time in the class? Yeah. Like why is it lower? Yeah. So was it was it because like they had less time? Yeah. Uh, to focus on the class when they had more time to do the active learning. Yeah. Or was it? Because of what exactly? And the, another question: um, Do you think that st um, practices such as uh, community, um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's called community. Um, uh, wait, uh, community. Uh, oh God, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like the first agreement. one. Community agreement. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, okay. If, if community, would you do you think in large yeah. uh, classes, community agreement would help? Yep. In uh, making it easier. It's a good question. Great yeah. question. So let me get to your first one. Yes. So the authors of that paper speculated that uh, the reason that students are, are evaluating the active learning class lower when the faculty member is the same, the content's the same, the amount of time required is the same, um, is due to the increased cognitive engagement that is required for the active learning class. You, you, it's a lot harder not to engage. Obviously, we can't force students to engage. They have to do that on their own. But in an active learning environment, I mean, just imagine it. You're sitting around a table. You have a group of two other people. You've, you've been sitting with them now every week. You have a TA who only has eight other people to pay attention to. Like You could choose not to engage. You could choose to sit there on your phone. I have almost never seen a student do that, because that is just not really appropriate in that kind of classroom. And so what that means is that students are more likely to actively engage. And they're engaging with really difficult content, some of which, a lot of which, deals with ideas they've had about the living world their entire life that are incorrect. And so this is cognitively difficult. It's actually also emotional. 
Uh, you, you now are being told that you don't lose weight by sweating and you thought that that's how you lost weight your whole life and now you don't know anything about your body? Like this happens to students in these kinds of classrooms. And so this is not always enjoyable, but that is what learning feels like. And so that was the hypothesis of the authors and I think that that's well supported by a lot of our observations and I'm sure a lot of other research as well. And then this next question about community, like engage, uh, community um, agreements. Yes. Um, really well supported approach and so a community agreement is when group members are uh, so sometimes the faculty member could do it by sharing with the group what are our norms of engagement as that we as a community agree on and that is one approach and we can also have individual groups uh, write these agreements themselves and research does show that students who write their own agreements groups that write their own agreements have a much higher uh, likelihood of effective group work um, and so that is one really appropriate and effective strategy for helping make group work effective. Um, there are lots of others, and that's not necessarily required as part of the toolkit, but it can be one. I use my, I, I have community agreements for students. Um, and we remind them of these agreements throughout the semester, it, uh, and we evaluate them based on these agreements, though it doesn't impact their grade, but it still somehow matters to students. <laughs> um, and uh, we prepare our TAs to help groups manage the unavoidable conflict that will happen, especially because our groups are really heterogeneous. There are students in every group who didn't have a qualified biology teacher in high school, in every single group, almost certainly. And so more conflicts are likely to arise in that kind of setting. And so having people in the classroom who anticipate that conflict and help, can help students navigate that conflict and can encourage students to, ma to actually manage it themselves, which is a really important skill for people to build, is to actually try to ask your group member if they're OK. Um, that's part of the TA's preparation. And we didn't change a single group. We had 99 groups. Didn't change a single group the whole semester. 